Welcome everybody, my name is Lauren Oki. I'm in the Department of Plant Sciences and I also have an assignment in the uh, Landscape Architecture Program in the Department of Human Ecology here at UC Davis. I'm a Cooperative Extension Specialist in Landscape Horticulture. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Darren Haver, County Director at Cooperative Extension Orange County, uh, also Director of the South Coast Research Extension Center and he's the Watershed Water Resources Advisor. Um, for content, to co contributing content to this uh, seminar. So we're going to talk about managing landscapes on limited water. So the two main topics in this seminar, uh, key elements for landscape water conservation and then describing how to assess your irrigation system for proper operation. So under key elements for landscape water conservation, we'll be discussing briefly plant selection and design, the use of mulches, use of composts, composts, fertilization, and irrigation maintenance and irrigation scheduling. So when we organize our plants in landscapes, uh, we want to really use the plants that are appropriate for our, our region, um, specifically uh, plants that are adapted to our Mediterranean climate. Uh, so these plants are, are used to having limited water, a little water during summers, and then they rely on rainfall during the winters for their irrigation. Most other plants that we use in our landscapes tend to be more exotic, so they're not used to having dry summers, so we need to supplement um, the summers with irrigation. And it's not just good enough to be California native. For example, California coast redwoods are natives. Um, they're native to the north central coasts of California, but they're just not appropriate for use in landscapes in the Central Valley. So I want to talk a little bit about terminology when we discuss uh, water efficient plants. Uh, plants that are drought, drought tolerant are plants that are able to, to survive in dry environments, whereas plants that we describe as xerophytes actually exist, they're, they're, they're uh, evolved to exist in dry, in, dry, in dry environments. Some of the mechanism, mechanisms that plants might use uh, for drought uh, tolerance or avoidance uh, Avoidance is, uh, is drought escape, so plants just don't exist where the water is limiting. They may be, uh, have features that allow them to conserve water, or they may be really efficient in, in, in taking up water that's available in the soil. Plants might be drought tolerant. Um, they might have physiological mechanisms to maintain trigger uh, when water is limiting, or they might have other uh, chemical or uh, tissue uh, um, characteristics that protect the plant when uh, water is limiting. Or they just may be more efficient. Uh, plants just are able to grow and maintain growth when water conditions are, are limiting. So uh, to identify plants that are water efficient, we can look at their structure. These plants have usually have deep or extensive root systems so that the roots are uh, in a large volume of soil so that increases the resources that it might be available to them. Uh, the water that they take up could be stored internally. Um, and also plants uh, might have just strong structural support like the agave in the picture where uh, when water is limiting that the structure keeps the leaves erect. We can also look at leaf adaptations of water efficient plants. Uh, plant, these leaves are usually smaller. Uh, they might be lighter in color uh, and their surfaces might be uneven or they might change the orientation uh, of the leaves to the sun. All of these features limit the amount of radiation that, that the uh, leaves uh, intercept and decreases the uh, heat loading and then also in turn um, the amount of water that is lost through the leaves. A couple other additional features might be that they might have hairy surfaces or the leaves might be thick or, or often waxy. And those two features uh, also limit the amount of water that is lost through the leaf surfaces. When we uh, organize our plants in our landscapes, we would like to, we should uh, organize them into hydrozones. That is, plants with similar water uses should be arranged together so that they could be irrigated as a unit. So here's an example of a landscape with three different types of plants, uh, low water use plants, medium uh, use plants, and a turf. And turf is typically characterized as having higher water use. So 
it would be really difficult, you know, actually impossible to irrigate this entire landscape on a single valve. Uh, if you optimize the irrigation for the turf, then you would overwater the low water use uh, landscape plants. If you optimize the irrigation for the low water use plants, then you won't be providing enough water for the turf. So ideally then, this landscape would be irrigated on three different valves, uh, each for the uh, specific uh, plant water use types, and the irrigation in those zones would be optimized for those plants. So where do we get information on plant water use? Well, there's this one document called WUCLs or WUCLs. Um, that acronym stands for the Water Use Classification of Landscape Species, and here's the URL where that document is located. And here's a, a screenshot of the web page, and what the information that is contained there is uh, a user's manual, how to use the web page, how to search for plants um, in, in the database, uh, the, de the plant database itself. You can download the uh, entire, um, or the, the plant list that you search for, or the entire um, database, and also the user information. This, this page also has information specific for turf grasses. So we can go to this web page, look for the plants that you're interested in, in including in your landscape, and identify uh, which ones are in the different uh, water use classifications. So we would also encourage the use of mulches in our landscapes. Uh, mulches um, reduce direct evaporation from the soil. Uh, they also reduce so uh, or moderate soil temperatures. Um, it essentially acts like a blanket over the soil, uh, an insulator uh, over the soil to reduce the uh, uh, water loss and to reduce soil temperatures. Ideally, we'd like to see you have a, uh, a, a layer that is two to four inches thick. The other, be other benefit of mulches, too, is that uh, the organic matter, as it breaks down, it's contributed to the soil. Using compost uh, is a direct way to add organic matter to the soil and adding this organic matter improves water infiltration by improving the texture and structure of the soil. And that organic matter also uh, supports uh, biological uh, activity from organisms that live in the soil. We also want to reduce uh, fertilization to these landscapes when we are um, trying to address uh, limited water. Um, we want to only apply um, enough fertilizer to maintain plant health. Uh, healthy plants are much more efficient at um, dealing with uh, low water conditions than um, uh, nutrient-stressed plants. Maintenance on our irrigation systems, we need to make sure that, uh, that they are not only proper, but also timely. So proper maintenance uh, can be illustrated by this picture here. You can see that there's uh, three different spray patterns from these sprinklers, so the maintenance wasn't done quite properly. When there's three different spray patterns, then we start to affect how the water is delivered to that site. And you can see that it's also resulting to a tr tremendous amount of runoff. We need to make sure that we visit our landscapes uh, uh, often. Um, this homeowner is obviously uh, turning the irrigation on in the early morning when they're supposed to, but uh, there's a broken sprinkler head that's being missed, uh, which is resulting in a lot of wasted water. Even when we have drip systems, we need to make sure that uh, we visit them frequently to, to um, make sure that we make repairs uh, uh, when they are needed. In the picture on the right also shows that you know, even though the water's not on, you can still see that uh, uh, where uh, uh, locations are, uh, where repairs are needed, need to be made. So we often, or we always recommend uh, irrigating early in the day. And the reasons why is that usually in the mornings um, the temperatures are lower and that means that water, less water evaporates directly to the atmosphere. And there's usually less wind and the wind would carry water away from the targeted uh, place where we want the water to be delivered. We need to adjust our programs for irrigation monthly but at least seasonally. And Places where we can get information to help us do that is through CIMIS. CIMIS stands for the California Irrigation Management Information System, and here's the URL for that website. And CIMIS is a series of weather stations that um, when they collect the weather, they uh, estimate plant water use, and they give us a, 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 um, a parameter 
called ETO or Reference ET. Uh, most people refer to it as ETO. Uh, the CIMIS system uh, includes more than 145 weather stations around California. So uh, most of the entire state is, is uh, covered. There are some rural areas that are not uh, serviced by CIMIS. So one of the things that, that the CIMIS website is this map uh, of ETO zones. So CIMIS has divided California up into 18 different uh, ET zones and the descriptions of those zones are up here at the top of the chart. And I want to point out uh, this chart here in the middle and I'll blow that up. And what this chart is is the average reference ET by zone. So these colors are cor uh, correlate to the, or correspond to the colors in the, in the map. And then we have monthly ET rates for each of those zones. So if we look at zone 14 where UC Davis is located, in January the reference ET is 1.55 inches. That means that the reference crop that is used by the CIMIS system would use about 1.55 inches of water during the month of January on average. In the month of July, uh, we can see that that reference crop would use about 8.68 inches. So uh, having this information month to month gives us a, a guide to how we need to adjust our irrigation controllers uh, by month. I should also point out that this uh, chart is an, a monthly average. Uh, it doesn't um, reflect what is an actual ET rate and it also doesn't uh, uh, take into consideration rainfall which also should be uh, compensated for in the irrigation program. So when we adjust these programs seasonally, uh, if we have a time-based controller, we have to do that manually. We have to physically visit the, the controller and make the adjustments to, to uh, allow for the difference in water demand. If we have a, an automatic um, weather-based controller, uh, that's done by the controller, and we'll talk about that, how that's done a little later. Now, I want to talk about the irrigation control interval versus duration. Interval is a time between irrigation events, whereas duration would be the length of time that the, a valve is left open, for example. So the intervals might be the days between irrigations, and the duration is valve on time, probably minutes. So if we wanted to reduce water use, um, we, the proper way to do this was, would be to increase the uh, interval between irrigations. So the number of days between irrigations. So for example, if we are currently irrigating three days per week, we can have a 33% reduction by irrigating only two days per week. It is not correct to adjust the run times, the durations because that affects how much water we're applying for each irrigation and then that will affect how deep that water is getting into the soil. To make sure our irrigation systems are working properly, we need to, make, uh, we need to have knowledge of our system. We need to know uh, uh, all the details of, of the system and we'll, I'll go through that. We also need to know about water pressure because that has a direct effect on, on how we irrigate. We need to make sure that our system is performing in the, in the manner that it's, that it's optimal. And we may need to make sure that the, the water is applied in the manner that we um, design for. And then I'll also talk about uh, precipitation rates and infiltration rates. So different controller types. Um, the time-based controllers are the most common uh, controllers. They're based on a calendar. Uh, so you might program in uh, valve one to turn on for five minutes, valve three to turn on for seven minutes, and valve uh, four, for example, to turn on for eight minutes. And you might want those valves to turn on on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And every Monday and Wednesday, Friday, it'll go through that cycle and turn on the valves accordingly. So in order to make an adjustment, you have to physically go to the, the controller and either ad, uh, adjust the, uh, the, the days that irrigation will occur, occur or uh, when it's the rain season to turn it off. Weather-based controllers uh, actually measure or get information on uh, evapotranspiration and then they use that information to estimate how much water you, the landscape might use and then they will adjust a program to replace the water that is used, uh, calculated to be used by that landscape. So these because it uses weather information, then it has to get that information somewhere, somehow. Uh, some controllers um, might have a, 
a small weather station installed like this one here, or they may, be, may connect to a, a central information system either by telephone or by wireless system and uh, download that information uh, periodically, probably daily. Uh, once it take, collects that information, then it will do some calculations in the controller uh, based on some information that's programmed into it by the installer and then adjust the irrigation accordingly to uh, in, in, um, in uh, response to the, the, the weather. Another uh, controller type is uh, one that uses soil moisture measurement. And these, sensor, these controllers will actually uh, rely on sensors installed in the landscape that actually uh, measure the uh, amount of moisture in the soil. And based on the soil dryness or wetness, it will uh, initiate or allow uh, a soil to, uh, um, an irrigation to occur when the soil is dry. Some, con some controllers are actually able to uh, also terminate the irrigation um, once the soil is wetted to a preset level, then it will stop the irrigation. Um, then I, now I want to talk about different sprinkler types. Um, sprinkler types include the impact uh, sprinklers, and uh, these are, uh, have been really common in the past, not so much recently. Um, everybody knows them as rainbirds, and people are, are readily associate the sound that they make um, with irrigation. Uh, personally, I, I recommend that if, if you have these installed in a, in a home system that they probably haven't been maintained maybe ever, so they, they, they're probably not performing in the, way, in the manner they were designed to. So I would recommend in, uh, replacing them. Another type of spray that is really common are spray uh, heads. Um, these uh, distribute um, water over an area in a, in a fan spray pattern. Um, very, and they are very common. If they, unless they're um, well maintained, they're probably not performing in the manner that is appropriate. A newer type of system are known as rotary streams. Um, you can see these uh, in this picture, the streams of, of water coming out of the emitter and those streams of water move uh, in, a, in a radial uh, manner uh, to distribute the water uh, across the, evenly across the area that it's uh, providing the water to. Another type of uh, system are gurdry rotors, or, um, and these are usually used in larger landscapes and most likely in, um, in academic or institutional turf areas uh, because these are able to distribute water over really large distances, uh, 75 to 100 feet in some cases. So, uh, in addition to knowing what kind of sprinklers you have, you need to know specifically uh, what that sprinkler is designed to, for. Uh, and each sprinkler head or type is designed for a specific pressure. And the pressure has a direct relationship on how far the water is thrown, how, much deliver, how fast the water deliver, is delivered. Uh, so it's really important to know what that sprinkler, the pressure that that sprinkler is designed to, for. Uh, this one is rated at uh, in a range from 50 to, to 90 psi. You can see here in this chart, uh, most sprinklers have a, a sprinkler performance chart. This one shows uh, uh, at a pressure of 50 psi. It has different inserts indicated by these numbers for different nozzles, and the different nozzles will provide different um, distances of, uh, of uh, coverage and different flow rates through that uh, sprinkler. And so uh, it's really important, again, to know the, the, um, the pressure that that sprinkler is designed to perform it. And as I pointed out, pressure does affect the flow rate and the pattern that the water is distributed. So here's an illustration that I like to show about uh, the relationship between uh, pressure and, and distribution. And this sprinkler head, it's a, a, a half circle spray head uh, that's designed for 30 PSI and it's designed to, to deliver water out to uh, 12 feet diameter. So most people think that if you increase this pressure, uh, the pattern that will result would be a larger diameter of um, water being um, uh, delivered to, to the landscape. What really happens is that the diameter is actually less. And the reason why is that at, with higher pressure, the water droplets are smaller, 
uh, maybe even a, 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 a fog or mist. And those really fine droplets are, are either carried away by the wind or they can uh, evaporate directly in the atmosphere. So again, it's really important to know uh, not just uh, what pressure the sprinkler is designed for, but the operating pressure of your system. So the way that we check for the that operation, operating pressure is we actually have to open up the valve and you can see that this, this uh, um, auditor is putting a, a, a pressure valve right into the stream of water um, because we have to check dynamic pressure, the pressure of the water while it's moving. We, it's not appropriate, it's not proper to um, measure the pressure in the line when the valve is closed because that's not the same as the dynamic pressure. And it's the sprinkler uh, dynamic pressure that the, the sprinkler is experiencing. So another thing we need to do while we're checking for system performance while that valve is on is to look for proper operation, proper operation of the sprinklers. Are they rotating the way they're supposed to? Are there things blocking the, the water stream? You can see in this picture there's this uh, dr a dry patch here and what actually is happening, this tree is blocking the stream of water of the sprinkle that is actually behind it. Uh, so that's uh, causing the, that dry spot. You wouldn't see that if you just open up this line of sprinklers um, because that you would think that these sprinklers might be wet in that area. But, so you have to w open up all the valves and observe all the sprinklers uh, in the, in, in the um, landscape. And while we're doing that system performance check, we need to make sure that uh, for uh, part circle sprinklers that they're um, adjusted properly. You can see that this sprinkler here uh, is is not adjusted properly and it's actually irrigating part of the street on this side and it's missing the lawn, the turf on the, on the far side. So we need to make sure that the, the adjustments are, are correct. And so not just the pattern, but also to make sure that the, the water is being delivered the distance that is intended to, to be delivered. And usually the distance is uh, uh, between, it's, it's usually called head to head. So water from this head should reach the, the head of the next sprinkler next to it. And so what we need to do then is then measure, actually measure the distance between sprinklers. You can see this, op, this auditor here using a wheel uh, measure to measure the distance between the sprinkler heads. And with that information then we can check to see that the sprinklers that are installed are proper for that landscape. The other thing that we need to do is make sure that the sprinklers that are installed are actually plumb. Uh, sprinklers that are tilted will not deliver um, water in, a, in an even pattern. Uh, so in this case, we have to put a, a bubble level on the top of the sprinkler body to make sure that it's installed correctly. And if it's not installed correctly, if it's not plumbed, then we need to uh, adjust it and uh, uh, make it proper. So now I want to talk about distribution uniformity. Distribution uniformity is the description of how evenly water is applied to the landscape. And this has a direct effect on how long we leave the valve on. So in this example, uh, if we have a system that has a distribution uniformity of 49%, uh, depending on the flow rate and other, other factors, then we might calculate that the valve on time per week might be 96 minutes per week. If we increase the distribution uniformity to 72%, we can actually reduce the runtime to 71 minutes. So that's a 26% reduction in water use. It actually, that, so that's a direct water savings just by improving distribution uniformity. So how, what does distribution uniformity do? Well, so here's an a, a, a illustration of, here's two sprinklers. We have head-to-head -head coverage in between, the red line designates how deep that we, we want the water to, to wet the, the soil. Uh, this would represent the, 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 the bottom of the root zone of this turf in this example. And if we turn the valve on, then we know that uh, because we have excellent distribution uniformity, that we'll have very even coverage and uh, the timing is proper to wet the uh, desire, to the desired depth. If we have another system where the distribution uniformity is poor, you can see that we don't have head-to-head -head coverage. If we turn the valve on, what happens is that uh, in the middle between the sprinklers, we don't get um, wetting to the depth that we want. And in fact, in this case, uh, close to the sprinklers, we actually get overwatering. So what would, 
what would happen is that uh, we, we might be able to improve this DU a little bit or we might just turn the, increase the interval, the duration, I, I mean, the, of the, the interval uh, irrigation um, valve on time. So what would happen then is that we get uh, wetting to the depth we want, but all this water that is deeper than, than, we want, than we desired is actually wasted water. That water is not able to be taken up by the plants in this landscape, so it's, it's wasted water. So how do we determine what, distribu what our distribution uniformity is for our system? Well, you actually have to physically set out some containers in, in that irrigation zone. Um, there's guidelines uh, on, on the pattern to be used and how, how far apart they the, these containers are in relationship to the sprinkler heads. We turn the valve on, uh, let the, those containers capture water, and after a certain t amount of time, we measure the volume of, uh, uh, in each of these containers. We, from, the, from those measurements, we can calculate distribution uniformity. Uh, from that, we can calculate the runtime, and we, we need to know some other information that I'll talk about um, and so in this case, in calculating distribution uniformity, here's a, some, an example of uh, some volumes that we've captured. We've calculated the average volume of 24 and a half milliliters. And we'll call that average T. We need to then rank the volumes in order. So here's, a, here's the, the bottom three, the lowest three volumes, the 18, 16, and 14 milliliters, and the average of that is 16 milliliters. So we call that the, uh, the average of the bottom quartile. And then the calculation for distribution uniformity is taking the lower quartile average divided by the total average, and we come up with the distribution uniformity. In this case, the, the, tar the calculated average is 65%. In, in any case, in every case, we should be targeting a minimum of 70% uh, DU. The precipitation rate is actually how fast the water is applied. And that is, has a direct effect, is directly affected also by how fast the water enters the soil or the infiltration rate or the intake rate as some people call it. So what happens is if we're putting water on faster than the soil can absorb it, then that excess water ends up running off site and either going to a, a place that's unintended. So here's a picture where the, uh, you can see the, the standing water on the soil, the water still being applied. Um, the water, the soil is just not able to take up the water um, that's applied to it faster, fast enough um, than the, uh, and it will, it will cause runoff. So how do we check for precipitation rates and infiltration rates? Well, you actually have to go uh, uh, dig into the soil. We can use a soil probe and check to see how deep the, uh, the water, uh, soil is wetted. Uh, if you don't have a soil probe, a shovel works just as well. Uh, dig a hole and see how deep the, um, the wetted soil is. We want to, to go for um, deeper irrigations. We want to fill a large a volume as we can that can provide water to the plants. Um, so that means as deep as the, the roots are and not deeper than that. Uh, if we go deeper than where the roots are, then we've wetted soil that can't be used uh, by the plants. So again, so we check to see uh, uh, how deep the water uh, soil is wetted by using a soil probe or a shovel. So we can calculate precipitation rate based on the, the, the catch can test that we did earlier for distribution uniformity. Uh, we know what the average uh, um, uh, volume is of the catch cans that we've uh, collected. We, we know how long the valve was on, uh, so we just, use, just using those two pieces of information, uh, we can calculate what the precipitation rate is. We also need to know the, the containers that we use to catch the water. We need to know what the uh, uh, opening of, of the containers, the throat areas of, that, of those containers. What we would do is take the, calculate, to calculate precipitation rate, we would uh, uh, take the average uh, volume that was collected in the, in the containers, uh, multiply it times 3.66, the conversion factor from uh, minutes to, uh, from, uh, from hours to minutes, and then from square inches um, to milliliters, or milliliters to square inches. 
Uh, we divide that by the runtime in the thorough area and we come up with a precipitation rate. So from the precipitation rates and the distribution uniformities, uh, we can calculate actually how long to run the valves for each of our irrigation zones, but we also need a couple more pieces of information. We, uh, we need that, the ETO information from the uh, CIMIS charts, and we also need to know uh, how much water our landscape or the species that we're irrigating, what, their, what that, those requirements are. And for turf, there's some uh, easily available information um, uh, um, at, the, at, that, the, at the Wilkel site, um, and I'll use an example of uh, a, a cool season turf, or I'm sorry, a warm season turf used, needing about 0.6 uh, uh, of reference ET as, as an irrigation requirement. So we would take our, the runtime, um, we would calculate the runtime using the um, uh, reference ET, multiply it times the, in this case, the landscape coefficient, and two is just a conversion factor from uh, months to days and minutes um, to, uh, from uh, minutes and hours. And we divide that by the precipitation rate and by this uh, um, uh, term here uh, that, that modifies the distribution uniformity. What we get then is minutes per day uh, for, for our runtime. So where does the water go that we apply? Well, it, hopefully well, we want to put the, uh, the water where the plants can use it, and that's in the root zone. And that's where uh, the water is available for use by plants. But other places where water can go that we apply could be in runoff. If we uh, uh, apply the water faster than the soil can absorb it, then we generate runoff. And not that water is not just wasted water, but it also carries off-site uh, pesticides or fertilizers to uh, storm drains or down the gutters. If we put on, if, we're, if we have a really good distribution uniformity but our uh, valve on times are too long, then we're um, irrigating too deep. So the water uh, is wetted below the root zone and um, that water can't be used by, uh, by the plants and it, that water also could carry soluble pollutants into groundwater. And the other place that water can go is, is evaporation. Um, water could be evaporated directly from the soil surface or it could um, evaporate directly from the air during the application if we have pressures that are too high. Some things that complicate our irrigation are compacted soils. Uh, compacted soils will reduce the infiltration rate and will cause uh, premature runoff. Uh, different soil textures will affect how uh, we irrigate. Uh, clay soils have uh, lower infiltration rates than loams and sands, so we need to be aware of what kinds of soils we have, and that will um, um, affect how we apply the water. If we are irrigating slopes, the slopes will increase runoff, even though we have good infiltration rates, a good soil texture, just because there's a slope, we can um, cause runoff. The other problem too is regulatory issues. Uh, in some cases, we are only allowed to, to irrigate on certain days. So if we're, let's say, for example, um, we're only allowed to irrigate two days a week, then um, those days are fixed and we have to adjust or, and accommodate those, uh, th those regula regulations in our irrigation programs. So what do we do to assess how our system is performed? Well, we could do the, some of the things that I've described earlier. Um, I want to then really, really quickly, so we'll need to get some better information how to do a, a system performance check. Uh, there are kits that are available that uh, have the pieces in it that will uh, um, help us do the irrigation um, assessments. We can locate qualified professionals, and um, the California Landscape Contractors Association and the Irrigation Association both have certification programs for um, irrigation um, uh, technicians and irrigation auditors. Um, this is a picture of a, um, an audit kit that's uh, provided by uh, one of the distrib distributors. And you can see the different the catchment containers, the uh, pressure uh, devices, and, and et cetera. Uh, 
The other thing we can do, the, one of the easiest things we can do to improve system performance is if we have older sprinklers, if we have sp uh, sprays or impact sprinklers in our, in our uh, landscapes, home landscapes especially, upgrade them, put in rotary streams. In a study that I'm involved with, um, we uh, measured the distribution uniformity of uh, up more than 30 landscapes around California. And in three places that uh, where we just did a sprinkler upgrade, we improved the, the distribution uniformity by 21, 24, and 18% just by doing the upgrades. So here's a, uh, um, uh, some pictures on the effect of an upgrade might have. So here's a situation where it's a, a difficult to irrigate the landscape, it's on a slope. Um, you can see just after running the, these um, uh, fan sprays for four minutes that were gener generating runoff on the sidewalk. This landscape was, uh, was um, the, the spray heads were replaced with rotary streams. And here's a picture of uh, that, um, that system as when it was renovated um, running for 10 minutes and you, we've eliminated that runoff on the sidewalk. So when we are limited with water, uh, which might happen I think later this, uh, this summer, um, and it certainly has happened in some other locations around California, we have to choose what plants to irrigate. Things to consider are the cost of replacement. Uh, for example, annual plants or herbaceous perennials or even turf is less expensive to replace than a, a, a small tree or a large shrub. Um, we also need to consider beneficial uses. Uh, I'm going to show you here a city, an example from the city of Folsom that, per, had a, uh, that showed their uh, prioritized list. Uh, their top priority uh, is to maintain their trees. Uh, the community there relies uh, on their sports field, so that's the second top priority. Ornamental planting so is third down the list. And non-active uh, or ornamental turf grass would be the first uh, landscape um, uh, plants that would be um, not given water if it came to that. So the other things that we need to do when we're irrigating with limited water, we need to just re reduce irrigation. We need to start um, uh, not giving all of the water that the plants would really need to perform optimally in the landscapes. We need to make sure that when we apply the water that we're doing it efficiently. Make sure that our irrigations are, are working uh, as efficiently as they can. And we also need to make use other water conservation practices. That might be um, uh, turning off some of the, uh, uh, the plants, uh, water to the plants, uh, as we've seen in this fourth bullet. Prioritize what the plants that receive water. Things that I didn't talk about were knowing what water stress symptoms look like. When we start reducing the irrigation to our landscapes, we need to know what the plants will look like when they start uh, uh, into stresses uh, that might not be recoverable. So we need to know how far we can go with reducing the irrigation to these plants. And it also, we need also, need also to precondition the, these landscapes to enhance survival. We can't just decide um, today that you know, tomorrow I'm going to reduce my irrigation by 50%. We need to, to re do this reduction in stages so that the plants are, are used, getting used to being uh, um, not provided with uh, optimal water. And the last thing was, is that we need to start talking about uh, uh, managing salinity in the soil. Because when we start reducing the amount of water that's being, that is provided to the landscapes, then we're going to be um, um, changing salinity in the soil. And uh, some plants are just not tolerant uh, to salinity uh, as good as, as, as well as um, some other plants. So we need to make sure that we manage uh, salinity in the soil. And so that's what I have for you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you need, have any other questions, here's uh, our emails, and we'd be happy to address those for you.